here is New York. Commuters give the city its tidal restlessness. Natives give it solidity and continuity. But the settlers give it passion. E.B. White would have described me as a settler. In fact, I became a New Yorker to pursue my passion for design. My name is Daniela Ohad. I'm here at Elizabeth Collective, historic mansion in Midtown New York, where art and design live together, curated by Maison Girard. Welcome to Spring Dialogues. For Dominique and Jean de Menil, developing the taste for the modern was a lifelong journey. When moving to Houston in the 40s, it was clear to them that their house would reflect their vision for pure modernism. Philip Johnson designed that dream house. It was low brick, long structure, different than anything seen in that neighborhood before. William Middleton worked for nearly 15 years on a new and fascinating biography of the Demonils, Double Vision. William, how are you? Great, great to be here. Thank you. So for the Demonils, um, creating this house, which was so different than anything that was seen in Houston before mm -hmm. and after in a way, um, their house became their cultural legacy. Well, first they decided that because they took a look around in Houston and there was no great architecture. You know, not just modern architecture, there was no great architecture. And the Dominiels arrived in Houston, as you said, in the 1940s, and they came from a very sophisticated background in Europe. And they, were, they had been born and raised in Paris, and they arrived in the city that had no sense of history and very little art. And they took a look around and said, let's do something. And so the first building project they had was to build their house. And they said that if we're going to build a house, we want it to be modern because we want to show people what modern architecture can be. And we want it to be a significant architect because we want to inspire others here to hire good, nationally significant architects. So they chose Philip Johnson. And their, and their, their taste for the modern started many, many, many years before they moved to Houston. It's a great question. They, they were both raised in sort of tri traditional Belle Epoque kind of interiors in, in Paris, you know, very traditional 19th, late 19th century and 18th century interiors. Um, but right around the time they were married in 1931, they went to her cousin's house, uh, a chateau in Alsace that's called Cobsem, that was designed by a modernist Paris architect named Pierre Barbe. He was um, considered, he was involved with a group that was considered the French uh, response to Bauhaus. And the Dominiels saw this and they were so taken by what he did and they hired him to renovate their apartment in Paris. So that's really the beginning of their modernist quest. Both selected Philip Johnson to design the house. And, but when it came to the interiors, they rejected his proposal and they rather made this very unexpected, um, I would say, choice of fashion designer Charles James. Yeah, so first Dominique uh, said that all of Philip Johnson's interiors at this time, and you see it in the glass house, um, he would have wanted a Mies van der Rohe chair, a Mies van der Rohe square glass table, a little musty colored rug she said, and, and we, we realized that we would have gotten bored. And she said, she credited her husband. She said that her husband, who always had, you know, great ideas, dangerous ideas, said, why don't we talk with that fashion designer who you've been working with? Because at that point, she had known Charles James for five years. And she'd been wearing these beautiful gowns by Charles James, so she was very sensitive to his, his palette, you know, to, to uh, his design sensibility. And um, they brought him down to Houston, and they decided to have him work on the interior. So she wrote a letter to Philip Johnson, and he said, um, I've had the letter here for some time um, because I haven't quite known how to respond. He said, you know, uh, it's always difficult when uh, someone else will finish the interior of an architect's project. And he said, I admire Charles James greatly as a dress designer. And, <laughs> and Philip Johnson, 50 years later, after Dominique de Menil died, was back at the house um, after her funeral. They, they had a reception back at the house. 
and Philip Johnson cast a look around the living room and he said, and she didn't change a thing for 50 years. He said, it's like, it's like Balenciaga in here. She knew she had something that was perfect. We, a great taste grows from within. And I wonder, I'm gonna ask you, what did you learn from the Demineals about creating, about having educated tastes, and also what can we learn by reading this phenomenal book, which I read totally, uh, about, about achieving that level of taste. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that in the case of the Dominions, it was, it was, their taste was very personal. You know, they spent a lot of time thinking about what they like, you know, and, and, and I think they had the confidence in their choices, you know, to, to have an, a young but important architect like Philip Johnson and say, we don't want your interior, we want something completely different, takes confidence. You know, so um, their, their confidence in their choices, I think, came from education, from learning. One of the most anticipated events of this season is the opening of the TWA Hotel at JFK International Airport. It was built around the historic TWA terminal, the most celebrated architecture icon of the post-war years designed by Eero Saarinen. Richard Southwick, partner and director of preservation at BBB, is responsible for this amazing project. Richard, hi, congratulations. And uh, this is a story, a, a victory for historic preservation. Uh, it absolutely is. This is a building, probably the most iconic uh, airline terminals uh, in the world. What made this building important during the jet age when it was completed? And also, why is it important in the context of history of American architecture? Uh, the TWA terminals, uh, arguably the most iconic mid-century modern airline terminal in the world. It is really a symbol of the 1960s. Uh, it's expressive of the wonderful uh, expanding world of flight from that era. It's also expressive of uh, corporate identity. TWA and Howard Hughes, who ran t TWA, wanted to uh, make this an iconic symbol for their airline. He wanted this to be a tour de force, and a tour de force it really was. The entire building is supported on only four columns. Uh, it's an incredible tour de force from a structural standpoint. Uh, Serenin really wanted to show both the glamour and the excitement of flight, and I think he did that very well. And, and talking about glamour, when I look at those pictures, you know, that were taken by Ezra Stoller, for example, I envy the people who traveled at that time. When did the TWA terminal become irrelevant in terms of aviation regulations? Uh, TWA was irrelevant or obsolete shortly after it opened, surprisingly. Um, when it was uh, designed in the 1950s, it's a myth it was designed for prop planes Everyone knew jets were coming, um, but it was designed for a jet plane uh, with about 100 seats, the Boeing 707. Uh, the next big thing in the 1950s and 60s were uh, the supersonic transports. If you recall the Concorde, uh, that was to take over for uh, all the first jets. So when the 747 came out in 1968, truly just six years after the building uh, was opened, uh, the building essentially became obsolete. Um, it lacked both the flexibility and it lacked the capacity for the new changing airline industry. It's interesting that there have been attempts to expand TWA over the years and it's an unexpandable building. It is such a unique geometric shape or form that you really can't add on to it. You have worked on many buildings, on many iconic buildings. The TWA has a special significance for you. What is it? When I came to New York uh, to go to grad school, and uh, I went to Columbia uh, in 1975, the very first building I came to visit uh, was the TWA Terminal. I went on to work on uh, lots of noted preservation projects. Um, in 1994, uh, fully 25 years ago, um, I got a call from the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey, and uh, uh, they wanted, the, the building was just, um, uh, designated New York City landmark, and they wanted to know what that meant. So 
I became the historic preservation uh, consultant uh, for Port Authority for TWA, and we did a, a, a very large restoration project that uh, was completed about 10 years ago, which really set the stage for this new development. Um, about four years ago, I was actually asked by the developer, MCR uh, companies, uh, to see if I wanted to be the architect on this project, and I was absolutely thrilled. The building being vacant for the better part of two decades, uh, as you know, um, a vacant building is a dead building, and we had to get some life into this. And uh, we've been working on the design and the construction, and it will open within a few months. And, and the life that you're giving to this building is pretty fascinating. You made it into a lobby of a new hotel, and what type of experience do you want the visitors to have visiting this hotel, staying in this lobby? Is it red? Oh, it's cherry pepper red, TWA <laughs> red. Okay. Uh, the original terminal, the historic building, will be the uh, world's sexiest lobby. You know, it's, uh, it's a lobby for a much larger hotel. There'll be over 500 rooms. So when you look at the building, you'll really see uh, the focus on the historic terminal itself being fully restored. And if we do our job right, uh, the experience will be bringing back the glamour that people knew from 1960s. Since the date opened on July 20th, 1959, the Four Seasons succeeded like no other American restaurant to become an icon in New York City's seminal success. The restaurant, not to be confused with the hotel chain, was designed by Philip Johnson and some of the leading design legends of the time on the ground floor of the Seagram building. Crowned with a curtain by Pablo Picasso, it was known as the world's most beautiful public restaurant, which has come to change the way people experience fine dining. Michael Ellenbogen is working on a new documentary, It Happened Over Lunch, and I, together with some great people who care, want to help him to complete this important project. Michael, hi, how are you? I'm great. Good. The Four Seasons restaurant served its totally last meal three years ago on its 57th anniversary. What in this restaurant made it an American icon? An icon is something that's extraordinarily influential, something that takes on a life of its own and means many different things to many different people. Um, the Four Seasons is all of that. Um, on many levels and from many directions. And, and also the idea, the notion of four seasons. Can uh, you explore this a little bit? Absolutely. What does it mean in terms of dining? It means there was se a seasonal menu. Uh, the chef Albert Stockley was the first chef who worked on uh, with James Beard and with Mimi Sheraton, one of the original menus, and they decided it was going to be a menu that catered to the season so that they could provide fresh ingredients. What about that design really came to capture your interest and imagination? That's a tough question, Danielle. It's like more like what about that design didn't capture my attention? That's this, the is, this is like the opening credits of The Godfather. You've got the best of the best that they went for. So, so you are now, you've been working on this documentary for a while and now you are, you want to complete it. And you have some really interesting ideas on how to do that. So how can we help you? First of all, anybody can visit our website. It happened over I love that. I love that uh, title. Is Thank this going to be the final title of the film? I hope so. Yeah. <laughs> the Four Seasons was, if anything, known for its lunches. One of the things that we're starting this spring is a series of events to really connect people directly with um, the excitement around the stories and the people that made this icon happen over the last 57 years. Um, so we're going to be producing a series of lunches, dinners, receptions at the new Four Seasons oh, wow. um, where people will get to spend time with a special guest. Well, our first guest um, is going to be Paul Goldberger. Oh, of course. Yeah. Paul probably knows more 
about the Four Seasons restaurant and what it means to New York and what it means to the world of architecture and design than anybody I've met so far. The plan to demolish the tower at 270 Park Avenue has provoked criticism and saddened the architectural community and those in support of sustainability. It will be the tallest building to be voluntarily demolished in history. But this glass tower started its life in a very different way when it was completed in 1960. It was praised as a glamour example of corporate mid-century modernism. And it was designed by a woman, Natalie de Bloy. Gabrielle Espedi, architectural critic and historian, is a scholar expert on de Bloy. Gabrielle, thanks for coming here. Thank you, it's my pleasure. What makes this building significant? 270 Park Avenue, the Union Carbide original headquarters, is significant for several reasons. You've already alluded to. The first is that it's a, a very fine example of what Ada Louise Huxtable described as the Park Avenue School of Architecture, which was a particular moment in which modernism that had initially come here from Europe um, really became mainstream in the United States after World War II. And uh, embodied a kind of moment of economic prosperity and a real sense of cultural optimism. Uh, even though we have unpacked that history of modernism since then, 270 Park Avenue is an exceptionally fine example of what William Geordie called the best of the architecture of bureaucracy. So it's significant because of its architecture, but I think you've also alluded to the fact that it's going to be demolished, which Unfortunately, it's um, going to make it even more significant. We'll make it even more significant, and quite frankly, we'll give it a kind of history and um, a public persona, you might say, that it might not have had otherwise. So, in some ways, its absence from the skyline may ultimately contribute to it being better known, much like the, the um, demolition of Penn Station in the 1960s caused the building to become a profound icon of the city. And the structure itself was regarded as significant when it was completed, in addition to its very fine aesthetics. And, and I want to ask you about Natalie mm -hmm. Bloy, which is your expertise. Um, she, at, uh, she was working at uh, Skidmore Owens Merrill, and mm -hmm. she rose fairly quickly in the 60s. What was it like for a woman to work in this world, in this corporate architectural world in mid-century America. Yeah, Natalie, uh, Natalie, like many women of her generation, um, experienced great success, but they also experienced profound sexism. As soon as she gets there, um, she's put to work um, you know, as a draftsperson, but very quickly her skill is noticed. And as you indicated, she does rise fairly quickly, um, uh, working on a number of extremely prominent projects, the iconic buildings that, uh, that SOM is known for at mid-century. As she um, proved her competence as a designer, she was simultaneously dealing with the problematic culture um, which I don't think is just SOM, but we can only relate it to SOM because that's where she was employed. So for example, while they were happy to have her be a project architect and to meet with clients in New York and in the New York suburbs, further afield where they thought that the clientele was perhaps more conservative, they wanted her to not be the public face of the firm. How do you think she will be remembered in history? So I think Natalie will be remembered as um, a pioneering a designer, um, as a, a, a woman who made real contributions to recognizing uh, the situation that women faced uh, at mid-century in the profession of architecture, but also in the professions, right? Because she's a part of that generation that is really taking their place, if you will, uh, at the table in terms of public culture.
a leading force in architectural research and sustainability, she founded the international architecture firm Architectonics, which is the subject of a new exhibition at the 80s Architectural Forum in Berlin. Welcome, Winka Dubeldom. So you have studied uh, in both Rotterdam and New York, and these are also the main uh, cities where you are active as an architect. And there is something very similar in terms of the typography between the two cities. They both have flatlands and both have prominent waterfront. And that typography really lent itself to the title of the exhibition. What does it mean to you to live and work at the waterfront? It's uh, a great question. I grew up in... Um the part of Holland where rivers cross and medieval castles are placed. So I think that led to sort of an addiction of always studying how these two boundaries uh, meet and cross. And I guess I have to confess, I've mostly lived in cities with major waterfronts, but I think it is the tension of the fluid and the more structured that I kind of find fascinating. I saw in one of the videos, I saw that you are defining today our age as post-minimalism. Mm -hmm. what, what exactly it is and how do you define the direction of design and architecture today? The thought there really is we all love Bauhaus and actually Bauhaus exists currently 100 years. Um, but I think it is also the time where we start to work very much into three dimensions. Uh, and I think people are also ready for more of a kind of a warmer, uh, call it fuzzy, environment that is a bit more, uh, rel that relates better to our own human existence. And I think there is, there is a quite a big departure from the more stainless, sleek stone surfaces of, uh, of the, the Bauhaus style. You mean in terms of materials? Mm -hmm. In terms of materials? Materials and shapes. Yeah. And uh, you're not only an architect, but you're also an educator, and mm -hmm. you are the chair of the architecture department at UPenn. Yes. Um, how does this school stand in context of other architecture schools in America? Uh, I think what we think is very important is that our students um, become leaders in their field and I think what means that means currently today that they need to have a cross-platform uh, knowledge of different softwares uh, that they can argue uh, their points very well. I think students have to be ready to not only be designers but also leaders of teams that deal with those complex problems. I, I so. know from reading about you, you're very concerned about, um, about having an identity, about presenting an identity mm -hmm. in your architecture. Can you say something about it and what type of identity do you look to negotiate in your buildings? I think personally that buildings should have character. And um, that means that it's a recognizable building, that a building speaks to people, that people are proud of living there. Um, and, and in order to uh, get to that identity or character, we um, really focus on really questioning what the building is and not assuming that the answer that is well known is the answer. Congratulations, Winka, and thanks for coming here. Thank you, Danielle. So nice. And thanks for being here. And until next time, remember, feed your taste. This episode was brought to you by Rego, a worldwide leader in the sale of fine design at auction.